Um, so, today, so today we're going to talk about um, the drugs that are used in the treatment of um, angina pectoris. Um, so before that, let's start with um, a short clinical visit. So uh, the patient, a 56 years old gentleman, was admitted um, for a diagnostic evaluation of a recent onset of chest pain. Um, three days before admission, he woke up in the middle of the night, complaining of a tight precordial pain um, of high intensity, lasting for 20 minutes. So the pain radiated to the upper left limb. So upper left limb. And so, and this was accompanied by dyspnea, okay, shortness of breath, which led him to seek medical attention. The myocardial, the myocardial injury markers, okay, the cardiac biomarkers, were not increased, and the ECG was not considered to be suggestive of acute myocardial ischemia. And after receiving ethanolol, okay, a beta blocker and aspirin, um, he was given an appointment at the cardiology clinic as an outpatient. And in the two days following the initial presentation, of, um, he had two lower, two new lower intensity episodes of the pain, and he was, and subsequently he came to the hospital. He also complained of dyspnea on exertion. Okay, so whenever he does, uh, whenever he exerts himself, for example, he starts walking or climbing the stairs and etc. Um, he complains, uh, he feels shortness of breath. He feels short of breath, uh, which progressed over many years and had not intensified in the period. So he was a smoker of 30 cigarettes per day and also diagnosed to have hypertension, which was controlled without medication. And on physical examination, on March 25th, the patient was in good general condition, ready, uh, meaning it's um, healthily red in color, hydrated. Um, his breathing rate was normal with a regular heart rate of 80 beats per minute, blood pressure of 132 over 78 millimeters mercury, and also had normal lungs and heart upon auscultation. And there were no changes upon examination of the abdomen. The peripheral pulses were normal, and there were no, there was no edema. Okay, no edema, no, and also there are no signs of deep venous thrombosis. So the ECG at rest showed a sinus rhythm, heart rate of 82 beats per minute, PR interval 160 milliseconds, QRS 110. QT, 360 milliseconds. Um, there, were, there was uh, left atrial enlargement, an ST segment flat in leads 2, 3, and AVF, and also elevated um, ST segment from V1 to V3. And also um, in positive and symmetrical T waves in leads V5 and V6. So this, um, case was taken from this um, article, um, which is available on, online. So basically, when we talk about um, someone who comes with angina pectoris, um, there are two types of um, management. So we have the lifestyle modification, which includes exercise, okay, advise patients to exercise once it is suitable for them. Um, quit smoking and also weight loss. And then we have risk factors modification. Uh, we try to control the hypertension and diabetes as much as possible. Besides that, we have the pharmacological management, aspirin, beta blockers, nitrates, calcium blockers, okay, statins, and potassium channel activators. Okay, so this can be some of the 
part of the armamentarium that are used to treat um, angina pectoris. So drugs used in angina pectoris. So we have vasodilators, such as nitrates, and also calcium channel blockers. So nitrates, we divide it into three, usually according to the uh, um, duration of action. We have short duration, intermediate, and also long duration of action. So cardiac depressants, they have calcium blockers and beta blockers. And then we have the other drugs, metabolism modifiers and rate inhibitors. So angina pectoris um, is a strangling or pressure-like pain caused by cardiac ischemia. So there are two main ways in treating angina. We reduce the oxygen demand of the heart, or we can increase the oxygen delivery to the myocardium or both. So a bit on the pathophysiology of angina. So we have atherosclerotic angina, also known as angina of effort or classic angina. So this represents the great majority of angina, anginal cases, 90%. It's associated with atheromatous flux that partially occlude one or more coronaries. So when there is increase in cardiac work, obstruction of flow and insufficient oxygen delivery, this will lead to collection of acidic metabolites and ischemic changes that may lead to myocardial pain ending stimulation. Okay, it leads to stimulation of the myocardial pain endings, pain endings in the heart, okay, in the myocardium. So usually in cases of angina, um, rest will lead to relief of pain within 15 minutes. The second type is vasospastic angina, also known as breast angina, variant angina, or prince metals angina. Um, this type of angina involves a reversible spasm of, of coronaries, usually at the site of an atherosclerotic plaque. Okay? So we have reversible spasm in this case. So we have spasm of the coronaries, which is reversible. So usually at the side of the plaque, okay? So there's a plaque. So this spasm can occur at any time and may lead to unstable angina. So usually we see a transient ST elevation, okay? So this is PQRST, okay? So this is like an example of ST elevation, okay, in the ECG. QRST, so ST. So it's important to be able to recognize ST elevation, okay? So, so in vasospastic angina, because it's reversible, usually it's a transient, it's a temporary ST elevation on the ECG. The third type is unstable angina. Okay, sometimes we call it USA, also known as the crescendo angina, or more importantly known as the acute coronary syndrome. Okay, it's part of the acute coronary syndrome. So we have atherosclerotic plaques. Um, so we have a plaque, for example, somewhere here. Okay, and then we have a fractured plaque. So the plaque moves, okay, so it's fractured here. Okay, and then that will cause platelets to come in, okay. Among others, platelets will come in, okay. And at the plug, we'll have a vasospasm, okay. So it will spasm. And when there is increased frequency and severity of attacks, okay, of this, so we get unstable angina. So this is a precursor, the immediate precursor of an, a myocardial infarction. So it's treated as an emergency. 
So what factors determine cardiac oxygen requirement? So it's intramyocardial fiber tension. It's intramyocardial fiber tension. Okay, fiber tension inside the myocardium. So the higher the tension, the greater the requirement for oxygen. The more the tension, the more oxygen will be needed by the myocardium. So what factors determine intramyocardial fiber tension? So we have diastolic factors. So diastolic factors will be blood volume. Okay. So we have the heart. So how much goes inside? So the volume. And then the venous tone, okay, the tone inside the veins. Okay, the tone here. Okay, blood volume, venous tone. So that's diastolic factors. And then the systolic factors, the peripheral resistance, the resistance at the periphery, the peripheral resistance. Okay, and then the heart rate, the heart force. Okay, and then the ejection time, the time for ejection from outside of the heart. So systolic factors. So these factors will determine the intramyocardial fiber tension, and this determines the oxygen needs of the myocardium. So by adjusting one of these or a few of these, that will lead to a reduction in the oxygen needs, okay, oxygen demands of the heart. So we have preload and afterload, very important concept. So preload is the diastolic filling pressure, which is a function of blood volume and venous tone. So it's determined by blood volume and venous tone. So blood volume and venous tone. So blood volume, venous tone, okay, diastolic factors. These two will determine the preload, diastolic filling pressure. Okay, diastolic filling pressure to increase in my in, um, intramyocardial fiber tension. So venous tone will be um, influenced by the sympathetic outflow. Whereas afterload is set by arterial blood pressure and also the stiffness in the large arteries. Okay, the large arteries, stiffness inside here will determine the um, afterload besides the arterial blood pressure. So we have this vasoconstrictor and vasodilator stuff, okay, influences that acts on arteries and veins, which will determine um, the state of vascular tone. So the vascular tone is the balance between constrictor and dilator influences. So this, this is just a quick recap of um, what affects the vascular tone. Okay, so we're talking about myocardial oxygen needs now, still. So we, we talked about preload and afterload. Next is we'll talk about the heart rate. So the heart rate, as is quite obvious, plays a role in time integrated fiber tension. So at fast heart rate, the fibers spend longer time at systolic tension levels. and diastole is shortened. And diastole, as we know, is important, and this is a time for coronary blood flow. So when you reduce diastole, that means it, there is less time for the, the heart to receive its oxygen supply. Okay, so it, when diastole is compromised, that means that the oxygenation of the heart is also compromised. Okay, systolic blood pressure times heart rate is known as the blood double product, double product, okay, systolic blood pressure times heart rate equals double product. Um, this is a measure of cardiac work and therefore the oxygen need, okay. Third one is the cardiac contractility. So the force of cardiac contraction um, is another systolic factor controlled by, mainly by the sympathetic outflow to the heart, okay? Sympathetic through the vagus nerve. Um, the injection time for ventricular contraction. 
So it's inversely related to the force of contraction. So the, the shorter time for ventricular contraction means there is a there is a higher force of contraction. And this is also affected by the impedance to outflow. So when you increase this, that means that you increase the oxygen needs. Okay, ejection time, let's go back to the formula. So ejection time, you increase this, ejection time, you will of course increase the oxygen needs of the heart. So this is just a quick um, recap of the blood supply to the heart. So we have right atrium, we have the right coronary artery. And then we have the left coronary artery, so we have the circumflex artery. And then we have the anterior interventricular artery. And we have the posterior interventricular artery. So therapeutic strategies, there are two. Increase oxygen delivery. So these are the therapeutic strategies in managing angina pectoris. So if you can increase oxygen delivery or reduce oxygen requirements or both, or some of both, okay? So we have nitrates, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers. So these drugs reduce the oxygen requirements in the atherosclerotic angina, okay? So these drugs, nitrates, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, reduce the oxygen requirement in the atherosclerotic angina. Nitrates and calcium channel blockers also increase oxygen delivery by reducing vasospasm, okay? So they reduce the spasm, go, goes back to this as normal or near normal artery. So that will increase the oxygen delivery. So, and then we have um, myocardial revascularization. Uh, vascularization. So this will correct the coronary obstruction by either bypass grafting, what we call CABG or cabbage. Okay, we can do a bypass. So we graft take this usually from the, if I'm not mistaken, from the saphenous vein, the leg. Okay, put here, so bypass the obstruction. If there is an obstruction here, for example, do a bypass. Or here, bypass. Or we can do an angioplasty. Um, so which is um, you enlarge the lumen using a catheter. Okay, usually we do it from the femoral artery in a cath lab, I call it catheterization lab. Okay, so um, we'll continue next time um, talking on the, in the next series, talking about the nitrates.